Live stream, wood stream. Welcome to our Wednesday night prayer meeting and Bible study. We're pleased to have you on tonight, and we trust that you've had a blessed day, and tonight's lesson will add to that blessing. Well, let's all stand, shall we, as we give glory to our great God, who's worthy, as we recite together, glory be to the Father. Let us recite. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Well, our text this evening is found in the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verses 26 through verse number 31. And we're going to continue on our theme of governance and rule. Governance and rule in that there's so much unrest in our country as we speak. And so we need to look to God's word for greater understanding regarding governance and rule. And we'll see what the Holy Scriptures have to say to you and me on this evening. Well, let's look at God's word as we look at the media wall, verses 26 through 31. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the animals, all the earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls upon the earth. And God also said, look, I've given you every seed bearing plant on the surface of the entire earth and every tree whose fruit contains seed, this food will be for you. For all the wildlife of the earth, for every bird of the sky, and for every creature that crawls upon the earth, everything having the breath of life in it, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. Evening came, and then morning, the sixth day governance and rule. When you and I look at the scriptures, we study it regarding the book of Genesis and the ancient rabbis would tell us that the Garden of Eden was three things. It was, quote, a temple, a kingdom, and a paradise. So let's understand why it is referred to as a temple. If there is a temple, and if the, and if, um, and if the Garden of Eden is, was indeed a temple, then of course you have to have a priest. So, Adam being the head of the creation under God, Adam, of course, as we know through the scriptures, let everything that hath breath praise the Lord that the entire creation, the earth, is to be filled with the praise and the knowledge of God. So the earth is to give glory to God. All of creation is to give glory to God. And man under God is to lead the creation in its praise and glory to be rendered to God. So Adam is in this garden, if you would. It is a temple in the context that he's to offer up glory and praise to God and the earth is to be filled with the knowledge of God, okay? And so it will be Adam's responsibility eventually to teach his sons and daughters and descendants the fear, the glory, and the magnificence of God. So the Garden of Eden was a temple according to the ancient rabbis, but it's also a kingdom, a kingdom that it is a place of rule. God gave man rule dominion authority over his hands. So the Garden of Eden was Adam's realm of domain. It was his domain where he would bear rule under God. And then the Garden of Eden was a paradise. The Hebrew word for garden is paradise, okay? So a garden is a paradise. It is intended to be a place of peace, love, and joy. 
So God made everything. God made the man in six days, the seventh day he had rested, the creation was complete. It was complete. God had, quote, created the temple, the kingdom, the paradise, and man is to rule over all of this in a spirit of peace, love, and joy. What more could God possibly do? Now, we know that God told Adam that he was to keep or guard the garden. He was to guard, keep the garden. So in that he's to guard the garden, it's implicit that you must protect the garden, that there is going to be, quote, a challenge to your dominion in your domain, in your domain, in your place of jurisdiction, there will be an attack. Adam was to guard and protect, keep the garden, understanding that he's bearing rule, that the Garden of Eden is his place of domain, so he is to anticipate a threat to that domain. All right. So we know what would happen. The serpent would come in and he would do what he did. And of course, we all know what happened through that. What Adam failed to ascertain is this, and it's something that we need to understand, is that God's enemy is our enemy. We have a shared enemy. Now, why do we say that? We have a shared enemy because we share God's authority. A threat posed against God's authority is a threat posed upon our authority because we have delegated shared authority from God. What Adam failed to realize is that the attack of the serpent, as it appeared, was not against Adam. So Adam and Eve were led to believe, you know, uh, God knoweth that in the days thou eat thereof, thy eyes shall be opened, and thou shalt be as God's knowing good from evil. So what was happening there is that the serpent is not my enemy. He's not my enemy. He's just telling me some things about God. So in lieu of that, I need to pursue my self-interest because God doesn't have my interest in mind. God is trying to keep some good things from me. So in other words, the serpent posed God as being our rival rather than recognizing the serpent as being our adversary. And what Adam failed to realize is that whoever attacks God's authority is also an attack upon your authority. Adam failed to grasp that. Now let's go in our Bible to so Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, and we're talking about governance and rule, and so we're, we're laying the foundation to understand these things. So Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 and 2, and this is very, very important because many people live and die, and they never quite understand something. So let me make this evident to you. Revelation chapter 20, verse 1 and 2. John wrote, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven with the key to the abyss and a great chain in his hand. He sees the dragon, that ancient serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him for 1,000 years. Now we are explicitly given the identity of who the serpent was was. So in other words, what we need to understand is this. Serpent in Genesis chapter 1 is a physical 
entity, a physical entity, okay? But also in Genesis chapter 1, the serpent is a spiritual entity. In other words, somehow or another, Satan evidently was able to take possession of the serpent and if you would uh, beguile deceive the woman and bring down the fall of mankind so our enemy is the dragon the serpent the ancient serpent the devil who is satan okay so when it comes to satan who is the ent entity that opposes the authority of God? It is Satan. But the authority of God on earth is opposed by Satan through physical entities or physical persons. In other words, for Satan to challenge the authority of God he must either influence the minds of men or possess the minds of men to, if you would, to oppose the authority of God on the earth. So Satan's goal when it comes to governance that he lays out for man, that he laid out for Adam, is that Satan's goal for man is, quote, self-governance when I say self-governance I'm not referring to temperance such in the way of self-control which, which is admirable and which is necessary and which is a fruit of the spirit I'm not speaking of self-governance in that regards I'm speaking of self-governance in regards of self-autonomy self-autonomy okay so in other words, rule yourself, you don't need God. You don't need God, rule yourself. Man should rule himself, which means that it is played out in the context of secular governance. Do not reference the sacred. Do not reference the divine. We are, quote, a secular society. We rule ourselves. We have no delegated authority from heaven. We are our own authority. So I think you're beginning to see some things that in our culture, we have been on a slippery slope for a long time as we have moved away from one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and life for all, justice for all, and we have moved down the slippery slope of a secular state that does not acknowledge God. Okay, so what, what were the consequences for Adam? When Adam, when God's authority and rule and dominion was attacked, Adam did not realize it was an attack also upon his own authority because his authority was given to him by God. What happened is, is the following. The temple was removed. Man was removed from the temple. Man was removed from the kingdom and man was removed from paradise. The Garden of Eden, according to ancient rabbis, quote, constituted a temple. God removed the man from the garden. God removed the man from the temple. Man was no longer fit for the temple. Adam had, quote, defiled himself. He's removed from the temple. The Garden of Eden was his realm of domain. It was the seat of his authority under God. 
he is removed from his domain. He's removed from his kingdom. The seat of his domain. He's removed from the Garden of Eden. And he is removed from paradise. The Garden of Eden, the word garden is a paradise. He's removed from paradise itself, the place of peace, love, and joy. He's removed from that. And now he has to start all over again. And of course, when he starts all over again, you know, it's just going to be a battle to experience love, peace, and joy. And he's going to experience so many things, just the opposite of those things. So the point is this. How important, important is governance? <laughs> Failure to understand governance in large extent has gotten us to where we are today, beginning with Adam. All right. So that being the case, before we make some practical applications, that being the case, notice what Jesus is going to do. Okay. So Jesus, he sent from the Father, he sent from heaven, and notice what he does. Man is removed from the temple Jesus is the temple. Jesus is the temple of God. Okay? Destroy this body, destroy this temple, in three days I'll raise it up again. He's the temple. Jesus comes preaching the kingdom of God. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And guess what? He was the king. Jesus Christ came preaching paradise. This day thou shalt be with me in paradise. Adam's failure in the way of governance and rule Christ came to reestablish the order of God applicable to temple, kingdom, and paradise. Where Adam got it wrong, Jesus gets it right. Where Adam had a colossal failure and collapse, Jesus comes about with restoration. To restore. To restore what was lost. So, what is it that we know about Jesus and his kingdom and his governance? For the kingdom of God is not meat or drink, but love, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost. The kingdom of God can be reduced to one word. It is the word love. Governance falls short apart from love. No matter how wonderful the laws, the laws are on the books, if there's not love, those laws would not be adhered to. In other words, laws are like a body. Here's a body. Okay, here, here's a body. But the body has no life 
unless there is spirit or breath in the body. So in other words, for the law to become animated, alive, and functioning well, then you've got to have love. Or it's simply words on, a, on pages, on a, in a book, but there's no life to it. The life of the law comes from love. And so in our country, we have many wonderful laws. We have, for the most part, a wonderful constitution. And we have wonderful Bill of Rights. And we have the law, but we fall short in the way of love. And thus, the law is not being realized the way that it should be realized by all citizens of this great, of this great country. Now, remember this. Satan challenges the authority, the God-sanctioned authorities. He brings about insurrection, an uprising, a rebellion against the God-sanctioned authority. He inspires revolution to overtake the God-sanctioned authority. Now, the thing is this. As Christians, we have the prerogative as citizens of the kingdom of heaven. We're citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And we're citizens of the United States of America that we can petition. We can express our grievances with the governing authorities. That is a right we have as citizens. But that's, we're not limited to that. We don't have to take the law into our hands. We don't have to be part of a insurrection or revolution or anything to dissolve the God sanctioned authority. No, there's something else we can do. We can take our petitions and our grievances to God because he is king of kings and Lord of Lords. And all authority is subject to God's authority. Now, the thing is this, when we petition God and whenever we pray, it's not so much that God doesn't answer our prayers because God many times does answer our prayers. But many times when God answers our prayers, it's not within the time frame that we anticipate. God answers prayer, but it may not match the, the timeline that you want him to answer the prayer. He can answer immediately. He can answer eventually. Or it may be an extended period of time before he answers prayer. But God always answers prayer. And you say, well, why is it that the time frame of his answers are unknowable? That none of us know the time frame in which he's going to answer our prayers. Well, first of all, you have to realize God is not held cap captive by time. God created time, but he's outside of time and he's above time. God is eternal. He's not held hostage by time. And so with us, we're creatures of time and we want God to respond to things we pray about right now. God is not held hostage by time. The other thing is this. 
when God answers prayer or when there is, before there is the realization of God answering our prayers, before our prayers are answered, please be reassured that God is working. God is working things out in ways that are visible and in ways that are not visible or known unto us, but we have the confidence that he is a God who is working and who is answering our prayers and we can petition him. So when we petition God, what happens? When we earnestly petition God, it can do several things. It can prompt God to move immediately to answer prayer, to the prayer requests or the petitions that are made, or when God entertains the prayers and the petitions of his people, God can honor those prayers even before those prayers are answered by granting his people his peace. So this is why Paul says to the church at Philippi, in so many words, be anxious for nothing, but in all things by prayer and supplications, make your requests known unto God. And then the peace of God that surpasseth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus, our Lord. God grants us peace. Peace. So, <laughs> we have more than 10,000 years of human history. More than 10,000 years of human governance. Sometimes, we respond positively to the biblical concepts of governance and rule and there are times that we don't get it right and we have all kinds of problems. So let me share just a few things for us to close out and it's this. We can't get it right if we don't know what is right. So there is natural law But there's also what, we're, what we would call special revelation. Natural law that is universal, is universal, is known unto all mankind. It is self-evident. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created by their creator and endowed with certain inalienable rights. So our constitution is a natural law document. Here's a problem. Many of our scholars, lawyers, judges, judiciary, many of them are trained and they don't believe in natural law. So we have a natural law document, the constitution, but the training of most people in the judiciary is that they don't even hold to natural law. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created by their creator. How many of them even believe in a creator? And are endowed with certain inalienable rights. Inalienable rights are God-given rights. If you don't believe there's a God, how can you believe that God has given you rights? We have fundamental failures because 
we no longer believe the founding documents on which the nation were built on. So it's a natural law document, and natural law is universal, that some things are self-evident to all people in all places and at all times. That's natural law. So in other words, when we see an injustice, when we see a person being abused, so on and so forth, there is a consensus throughout the world that this is a violation that regardless of what continent, what people group, what tribe or whatever, when they see it, they know it. They know what it is when they see it. That's natural law. Self-evident to all people in all places at all times. That's natural law. That's our constitution, but many jurors no longer believe in that. So we have to understand well, what is natural law. Then secondly, we have to understand special revelation. Special, special revelation would be, quote, the scriptures in the context of certain things you can't know unless God reveals it. God has to reveal things. So if you don't believe in natural law because you've been trained differently, and then if you have a disinterest in the scriptures, then everything thereafter is that you're left to relativism. Relativism. In other words, relativism is you determine for yourself what is right and what is wrong, and reality must correspond to my perception rather than my perception corresponding to reality, which means that a group of people can see the same incident and see it totally different based upon relativism. This is why people get so frustrated, is that they say, how in the world can you see that and not see an injustice? Well, when the culture has moved towards relativism, truth is each their own. What's true for you is not true for me, and what's true for me is not truth for you. You create your own truth. You create your own reality. And so, which means this, when you have a culture of relativism, rather than a culture of objective truth, based upon the principles of God's word, with relativism, there's the great difficulty of building consensus. You can't have significant consensus when you are overtaken with relativism. We have got to get back to the biblical order what governance and rule looks like in the scriptures, okay? And remember, for the kingdom of God, it's not meat or drink, but love, joy, and peace in the Holy Ghost, and love does no harm to its neighbor. Now, fathers help to create order. Fathers help in the way of discipline and order. And we all need discipline and we need order. Mothers contribute significantly to a child in the way of the development of compassion, empathy, and understanding for others. It's not enough to have order and discipline. It's not enough to have love and empathy and compassion and understanding. You gotta have it all, you gotta have both. You gotta have both, you gotta have both. And if we go in one direction to the detriment of the other direction, then we're gonna be 
off-centered. In other words, there is a place for love, for empathy, for compassion, but there's also a place for order and discipline. It's both. So, as our homes have deteriorated, if you would, the culture is, quote, off-centered in either direction. Because the nurturing, the training of the child and children who come to become adults is off-centered, and we can have law enforcement officers who are given over to order and discipline, but lack love, empathy, and compassion, and that's not going to work. And then we can have some that's given over to love, empathy, and compassion, but the fact is you're also dealing with the criminal element that can be very cruel and, and wicked and mean and so forth. You got to have the full package of order and discipline, love, compassion, and empathy. So I suggest to you, the only one that can pull that off is God himself through his Holy Spirit. That it takes God to grow us, to mature us, to form us into complete souls that we are full, brought to the fullness of Jesus Christ, that we grow in maturity so that we can function, relate, govern, and rule in our culture with one another in the way of love, peace, and joy that's in the Holy Spirit. I think as you have listened to me <laughs> on tonight, you know, it's, it's sometimes, it's, sometimes things are so simple, our problems are so complex, and because the problems are complex, we think the answers are complex. But it's not really, the, it's really not the issue. What we really have here, we have a spiritual problem. <laughs> spiritual problem that's manifested itself in societal ways. We have to get back to our biblical premise. We got to get back to Christian ethics. We got to get back to the understanding of godly governance and rule. And when we embrace those things and we live and breathe those things and we hold to those things and we live those things out, then we can have that influence in the culture that the culture then realizes, boy, it's certainly good to be ruled by love, joy, and peace. But for that to happen, I've got to be ruled by Christ. Christ needs to become my savior so that God can rule in my life and I can enjoy the love and the relationships with others and love does no harm to his neighbor. Governance and rule, I trust that tonight's lesson has been a blessing to you. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for our gathering tonight around your word. And God, we realize that we are complete in Jesus Christ, that all that we need is in Christ. So Father, help us to grow up, help us to mature in Christ. Help us to seek thy wisdom and thy strength, that God, that we might be wise and that we might be compassionate and that we might be humble, that God, that people might look to us and look towards, uh, look towards you, Lord, as the answer to all the problems that we are encountering. So Father, we petition those in authority but even still, Lord, we petition you to God of heaven, that God, that your rule and your love would be pervasive in our culture and that, Father, we will be convinced of such and embrace such. We ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen.
You're dismissed. Go in peace. And may the God of peace go with you.